Okay, so let's uh, let's start the class. Uh, do you have any questions before we start for the assignment though for Go programming in general? All right, so um, this lecture will have two parts. The first part is a little bit generic about cloud computing and necessary components of how to make it possible and what it is. We've done it in the introductory lectures a little bit, but we kind of go over it again. Um, and then the second half will be about networking. Um, and um, I didn't know how much do you know and how much you don't know, so the networking part will be a little bit uh, as, we, as we go, right? Okay, so based on what you've um, experienced so far, um, we can say that um, cloud computing is kind of an umbrella term. It, there are multiple things which uh, go into it, and they have some characteristics which are um, generally agreed. Um, so one is that it's remotely hosted, right? So when you do your assignment one, you will put the code actually onto Heroku or another hosting provider, and the code will run unattended by you, and it will be hosted, right? Uh, so there are, you know, um, three tiers uh, services which allow you to do that for free, like we're using the Heroku one, um, or you can pay for the service. Um, so that's what the commodified kind of part is, right? Um, so you... Um, you basically, if you don't use it, you don't pay. If you're using it, you're paying. Um, we are using the GitHub API, for which we don't pay, to get some information back. Uh, if you were to require kind of um, a lot of data from them, they, then you would have to uh, negotiate some sort of agreement. And then, some of you experienced already, there are kind of... Uh, uh, line limits, so as an anonymous requester you are limited to certain amount of information you can ask per minute or per hour and then if you want to go up that you have to go to a, a next tier of the agreements, right? Um, and then the, the middle part, ubiquitous, so what it means is you can access the service from a mobile app, from a web app, from you know any system. Um, so it is kind of easily accessible. Uh, so those are kind of the main characteristics which we've already experienced. Um, and we talked about examples in the, in the first lecture. So we you know, uh, talked about Gmail, for example, being a, a mail client um, where you can access Gmail from anywhere. It is a service offered by Google. It is kind of a hosted in the Google Cloud. Um, they do clever things with email, for example, such that um, no single data center actually stores an entire email of yours, right? So for security reasons and for redundancy reasons, they split the data they have across multiple data centers. So then if there is an earthquake or if, if there is a, some sort of a impact on a single location, um, it doesn't affect the data that, that they store. Uh, also, a single data center doesn't have the entire uh, data, so if there is some sort of security breach or something, your data will not leak, because only part of the data will leak. So they, they're not officially discussing that, because they don't know people to know exactly how it happens, but they're utilizing some kind of a clever techniques to enhance the availability of the data and also the security. Um, all right, I will come back to that in, uh, in, in a minute. Um, so here we have kind of, a, kind of a general characteristics which are common for cloud deployment. So we typically have a massive scale, and that means uh, we're dealing with <coughs> large number of requests or large data sets, right? Um, we're usually dealing with homogeneous uh, environments. So you are trying to commoditize uh, either the data layer or the infrastructure layer. So you kind of uh, make it uh, easy for you to scale uh, and to serve the, uh, the audience, right? Um, you have virtualization. We will talk a little bit about it in a moment. Um, usually the cloud 
deployments are utilizing uh, low-cost uh, hardware and low-cost software. Uh, so, for example, you using um, the GitHub API, you paid nothing, right? You using some sort of software service, they have to do something for you, but it's effectively free, right? Um, why it's free? Well, the you know GitHub needs to the, the other monitors will not work uh, because I don't have the other cable, so only this monitor will work. Ap apologies for that. Um, so they um, doing the the service uh, as as a part of the operations, and then they can kind of uh, provide you this data based on the revenue that they're making elsewhere, but without charging for it. Uh, same with Gmail. I mean, Gmail is technically not charging you anything. They make money on the data that they harvest from the emails that you keep there, right? So they do some contextual search so they can offer um, commercial customers an ability to advertise to a specific groups. Same, same as with Facebook, right? So the business model is uh, different to the use cases that you use the service for. Um, but they kind of monetize on it and then they can offer the data you know for developers and for some of the uh, service providers effectively for free or very cheaply um, you have resilient computing what does it mean it means that if you have a natural disaster or if you have some sort of network outage or if you something major happens power outage uh, the computing can continue to work it's it's a spectrum, so some providers have it better than others. Uh, also, you have the flip side, so sometimes, you know, like with the GitLab uh, problem, like if the operator makes some mistake internally, it can affect, you know, large uh, population. Uh, but in general, cloud computing makes um, uh, computing a little bit more resilient than your traditional deployments, right? So if you uh, where to host the website uh, and you bought a hosting provider uh, to host your website they kind of let's say you have a virtual uh, machine which you deployed your web server on then if that web server goes down or if this provider has some power outage your website will not be accessible but if you're hosting it through some sort of cloud services which use redundancy and kind of um, um, duplicated kind of um, infrastructure you can seamlessly migrate uh, and have something kind of available and being respon responsive to your requests kind of even though there are uh, complications like beyond your control um, but it is kind of related to geographical distribution as well so most um, providers offer you a primary hosting like with Amazon you can choose of where you want to have your primary deployments but with some like with Google you actually don't do that you rely on Google doing the load balancing and um, managing the, the uh, geographical distribution for you um, so then you again you're more resilient to some geographical you know earthquakes or, 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 or things like that um, service orientation what does it mean it means that we think about cloud computing as services. Uh, so we think of them as providing some sort of API or providing some sort of service which can be accessed and consumed. Uh, so that's what we did for assignment one. We basically wrote a very simple service that is hosted in the cloud. Anyone can access that service and obtain an information about the repository, right? Uh, it's, it's relatively trivial, but it's an example of a kind of a cloud service oriented uh, deployment um, <coughs> because the cloud providers operate on economy of scales they serve millions of customers and so on uh, they do have improved uh, security features so for example if you were to write your own login solution your login solution would be by far weaker than Google's login solution why is that? Well, Google has a long history of doing logins and it has a large corpora of data sets and they can detect some anomalies much better than you can. So even though you can pull out your own kind of a login solution, it will be always inferior in terms of security to what Google is offering, for example. 
it would take you enormous amount of resources and ex expertise and experience uh, over a longish period of time to match that kind of security features. Again, there is a flip side, right? So the flip side is, again, with, as with example with GitLab, if something internally happens, then the effects are kind of enormous. If there is a data breach, then the effects are kind of enormous usually as well. Um, <coughs> all right, so what we really need is we need to have something that allows uh, customers to service themselves. Because of those economy of scales, we cannot have a system where there is a human in the loop. Uh, so if you're interacting with Heroku or if you're interacting with Google App Engine or if you're interacting with Amazon, you have noticed that you're doing it by some sort of client and by some sort of software or by some sort of a web interface and you're not really asking a human to do something for you, you're asking software to do something for you. So the, you, you have to have kind of a full automation of spawning things, shutting things down, deploying things and so on, so then you remove the human in the loop. You're doing it through software, with software, right? Um, you have to have um, measured service, so, you know, pay as you go kind of thing. We have to measure, you know, how to charge the customers. Um, even if you're not being charged, like for example with the GitHub API, they have to measure how many requests you are making so then they limit you to not exceed the quotas, right? So you have to have a measured service even if you're not charging customers. That's for security reasons or that's for um, uh, billing reasons or for uh, load balancing reasons. Then we have to have uh, network access, of course, most things, you know, um, are done through the network and you have to have um, rapid elasticity. What does it mean? It means that um, the services will scale, right? Uh, and this is a little bit, um, uh, it, it's marked here as an essential characteristic, but um, the, the terminology and the definitions are a little bit blurred. So for example, if uh, you buy a server on Amazon and you have a kind of a hosted server, which like using EC2, which you are paying for in the Amazon cloud, right? How many of you have or used uh, EC2 uh, on Amazon? None of you yet, so, but, so, so imagine that you log into Amazon, you say I want to spawn a virtual machine like you're doing on VirtualBox, but this virtual machine is actually spawned somewhere in the cloud. Um, Amazon kind of provisioned you an uh, actual physical box, and if there is some problem with that physical box, Amazon will email you saying, your actual box having, is having some problem, we will have to migrate it to a, another physical machine, please make backups and then you know, redeploy it on, on the new uh, physical machine. It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, there is no rapid elasticity, like you are actually have to do it manually, right? They will migrate you to a new physical machine, uh, which is functional, but it is still linked to a kind of a physical layer. It's not completely uh, virtualized. Uh, whereas with other providers, like with Google, you're completely unaware of where the machines are hosted and what hardware they run on. You're just using the uh, virtualized layer and then you can, you know, if they hardware fails, they m silently migrate you to somewhere else. So that's in terms of um, continuity of the service but and with elasticity is like, uh, if you have more requests than the current hardware can handle, they have to scale it up uh, or scale it down when the resources are not needed. So you often see that with um, cloud providers that when you first time ask for the API, like with, for example, with assignment one, if you deploy, deployed it on Heroku and you haven't used it for a while, the first request will take quite long time because they actually don't run your VM all the time. They only run it when the requests are kind of um, flowing, right? So f after a cer certain period of inactivity, they will basically shut it down and don't use resources, don't use electricity, don't use the RAM and so on, or CPU cycles. 
unless there is a request coming and then they say oh woo, there is a request let's spawn that service again and the service will be kind of uh, spawned responds to the request and then be active for a while until the kind of requests are flowing and after a period of ina inactivity it will be kind of uh, throttled down again all right so if we look into those characteristics we have some which I already mentioned. So no need to know means that you actually don't know how Google runs the, the thing. You don't know how many physical machines they have. You don't know where the services are. Uh, and you don't need to know to use the, the offerings, right? Um, flexibility and elasticity, we already discussed that in terms of CPU, its storage, server capacity, you know, network capacity, and so on. Um, and pay as much as needed. <coughs> Uh, so we try to commoditize it and use the services only and pay only for what we use. There is a, an interesting movement. Uh, there are some startups which are monetizing on it, uh, which is kind of broadly um, broadly named as, um, um, let's say, API billing, right? So you're trying to build a solution which will build the customers per a, an API usage, right? So you're rolling out, for example, uh, a solution which measures how much a particular customer is calling the particular API, what sort of data they do uh, use and push back and request and so on. And then you build a billing method or accounting method for an API calls, right? And then because it's kind of a generic solution, you can roll it out for different providers which are offering an API call, right? API calls. All right. Um, <coughs> so one more. So, so far what we discussed is kind of a general concepts. We've already discussed it and it, it was kind of like a review. We will go a little bit lower now to look of how it actually happens. Uh, so if you say you have a lot of money, you have some hardware lying around, I don't know, you have 100 PCs, you plug them all together, you now have kind of a, a infrastructure which you can offer as a cloud service for people to run some of the Linux boxes or what, what they want, or to run some software on it, right? But if you use the 100 PCs that you have and one of them fails, you have to replace it, but you don't want that failure to affect the kind of uh, layer on which you actually run the software. So what you would you like to do is you would like to separate the physical layer from the logical layer on which you run the software in such a way that the software continues to run even if some of the hardware is being replaced or removed or added, right? Um, so how can you do that? Well, you need some sort of virtualization. The other use case is like many of you did, you have a laptop and you have a Windows on it and you would like to run Linux as well or alongside. How would you do that? Well, you have to virtualize the hardware layer in such a way that Windows operating system and Linux operating system can share the same resources, right? We have, you know, single CPU, even if it has multiple cores, it's still a single physical unit we have usually a single driver controller for hard drive we have a single network card for network traffic and then if you have two operating systems somehow they have to share it right unfortunately you didn't have an operating systems course yet so my explanation about how virtual machines work is a little bit superficial um, you just have to imagine kind of the layering of how the operating system operates uh, but it, it basically creates kind of a software layer on top of the hardware and your applications never talk to the hardware directly. They, co they talk to the hardware via, via system calls which are implemented in the operating system, right? So you have kind of an operating system layer which separates your applications from the hardware and the operating system negotiates of who can do what with the disk. If you have multiple applications trying to read and write to a disk, but you have a single controller, you know, if you have a magnetic disk, there is only one head which kind of moves on the plate and reads bytes and, and writes bytes, right? 
So two things cannot access it at the same time. It has to be shared. So the operating system creates this kind of a sharing infrastructure for different applications to talk to the disk controller. But if you have two operating systems, then how would you do that? Well, that's where virtualization comes in. Virtualization is kind of a mechanism to further separate the hardware from the operating system, right? So normally you would think, I have my hardware, I have my operating systems with drivers and things, kind of low level things inside, and I have my applications. So now what we do, we separate the hardware from the operating system by injecting what's called hypervisor. And hypervisor is a layer which separates operating systems from the hardware, okay? So two very well-known hypervisors is a VMware and Zen. Um, do you know of any other hypervisor that allows you to run multiple operating systems on the same physical machine? Any ideas? VirtualBox, virtual exactly. So many of you do use VirtualBox and it is a form of a hypervisor which allows you to separate um, hardware from the operating system. Um, modern CPUs, because this is not a new concept, we actually have it already <laughs> back in you know 60s and 50s, uh, no maybe 50s, not may maybe from 60s, <laughs> when the IBM 360 was designed they wanted to separate the versioning of the operating system from the actual hardware in such a way that you can uh, upgrade the hardware without affecting what, what is happening uh, with the calls. They, they were kind of tightly coupled. So the notion of hypervisor was already back in there uh, and we kept using it and the modern CPUs, they have a special feature which allows you to share uh, the CPU and the kind of uh, hardware infrastructure between operating systems. In, um, in Intel, it's called VT, VTX, uh, stands from Virtual Technology um, Extensions, and with AMD, it's called AMDV. So if I go to Yeah, so VTX is the Intel equivalent and then AMD V AMD V is the AMD equivalent for a special functionality on the CPUs to allow your virtualization to be much more efficient. Uh, and how does it work? It works by uh, enabling kind of a, yeah, let's say context switching on the CPU and BIOS level in such a way that your operating systems running on this hypervisor behave almost as efficiently as on the raw platform. So there is almost negligible um, performance penalty if you're using this type of technology. So if you're running VirtualBox and you have a tick box saying, uh, should I use VTX or AMD V, depending on what uh, platform you're running on, you should always tick it yes. And in your BIOS, you should enable the VTX extensions. So then you take full advantage of the virtualization capabilities of your laptop. So then your Windows and Linux will run smoother and, and faster. In fact, it's the hosted operating system which will run faster. The native one, like if you're running VirtualBox with Linux on top of Windows, this technology doesn't really affect Windows, it affects the Linux. So if you enable it, Windows will not suffer much, but your, your Linux, uh, Windows will not suffer, but your Linux will run much better, right? Um, more natively. So <coughs> what do you need to know here? Well, you need to know that there is some, something like this, that virtualization exists. It sits between the hardware and the operating systems. Uh, there are different examples like Zen, VMware, and VirtualBox, and there are two types. One is called type one, the other one is called type two. Um, what's the difference? So type one virtualization happens when the hypervisor doesn't care about the operating system. It kind of makes its own functionality regardless of what operating system is out there, right? Uh, it's kind of a <coughs> more native, more closer to hardware layer. Um, so so um, ultra sparks CPUs, 
have that uh, Intel and AMD have that layer so the <coughs> uh, hypervisors which utilize this row capabilities are type 1 so for example uh, KVM is another um, well-known uh, hypervisor layer which is actually a, a module inside the Linux kernel so KVM is like a, a part of the kernel which deals with, uh, with virtualization and even though it runs inside the operating system it is kind of um, not really utilizing the services of the operating system it kind of works more natively it's closer to hardware whereas some of the um, some of the um, hypervisors such as VirtualBox they kind of sit on top of host operating system and they offer services to virtualize the guest operating systems and they usually consider type 2. There is a little bit of a discussion whether VirtualBox is truly type 2 or type 1 because if you do enable VTX and AMDV uh, you're kind of quite close to, lay to type 1 uh, but you can run VirtualBox without the VTX or AMDV, right? In which case it will basically use the operating system facilities to do the virtualization of your Linux or another guest operating system. Um, so what, what virtualization gives us? Well, virtualization gives us the abstraction layer over the hardware so then we treat it as software right so normally your operating system talks to the hardware via a driver and the hardware kind of responds with something right but now because we've injected the software layer layer your operating system actually doesn't talk to the hardware it talks to something that pretends to be a hardware but in fact it's a piece of software right so that's fundamentally mind-boggling and it has been happening for the last say 15 20 years and we've been turning hardware into software almost in all areas of our lives um, so in the context of the cloud we have um, infrastructure as a service or as a software you will have you can take in the fifth semester the course with uh, eric and eigel uh, where you basically treat all computing, all CPUs and networking and everything as pieces of, of software. And you instantiate them as you're instantiating your objects uh, in your C++ code. You configure them and you use them as if they were physical devices, but they actually not. They're just pieces of software. They behave like physical devices. They emulate physical devices. And at some <coughs> level, they talk to physical layer. They, you know, talk to the wires. Uh, but as far as you're concerned, you're only dealing with software. Uh, there was a very interesting case with uh, network as software. Uh, so let's say 10 years ago, uh, a couple of people thought, well, you know, uh, maybe instead of buying Cisco routers, uh, which is this piece of you know, hardware that you buy and plug the cables in, <coughs> what we can do is we can virtualize it and create a router which is just software based, right? And people said, yeah, it makes no sense. Like, you know, we, we have those cables here, they come into this box, we need to buy a Cisco router, right? Um, so if you look at the history, you know, 15 years ago, uh, Cisco, and still is, is a huge um, giant uh, corporation producing hardware for networking. Um, but it's, cumbersome if you have to deal with hardware. So imagine you have those 100 PCs that I talk, t t told you about before. And now you have to create an infrastructure to serve them to the outside world. So you have the outside fiber optic cable coming in, and then you have to buy Cisco routers to co connect all those 100 PCs together, right? So you did, you bought some Cisco routers. Uh, but then what happened is there, there is an upgrade, there is a new version of the router which works better or you need a firewall or you need some more, um, you know, this, this billing engine, this accounting engine which checks some API calls and so on. You have to go to Cisco and buy additional boxes and you kind of have your rack mounted with full of hardware and then every upgrade or every thing you do, someone needs to go there and physically touch those things and plug them in and so on. 
if you can virtualize it into one massive computer which has a lot of pipes coming in and the fiber optic coming out you can basically configure it as a software you can say now I want the firewall poof you instantiate the firewall now I need you know a traffic shaping engine you instantiate it it's it's a matter of software and it's much easier it's easier to upgrade it's easier to configure and it's easier to <coughs> uh, manage than the physical devices so we will not spend much time in this course on this but you can think that in fact when we are talking about cloud it's kind of like a onion where software talks to other software which talks to other software which talks to other software and at some point something really talks to the hardware but usually it's virtualized away in such a way that it is um, not um, it's fundamentally flexible it's commoditized to a point that it doesn't matter what it is we can substitute it with something else and everything on top of the stack continues to operate um, all right so what are the benefits? Um, we can basically run stuff to be infrastructure-less, right? We can build, um, if you were to build a new Gmail, you can do that and you can deploy it without having any infrastructure of your own. You will just pay a per need basis to a cloud operator, right? Uh, so you can prototype some services or some proof of concepts you can build an app <coughs> or you can build a mobile game which has some uh, multiplayer support and you will only pay for for how much people are actually using it right um, so this this gives us this um, you can save or balance capex versus opex what, what is capex and what is opex do you know So le let's say you are a startup and you want to um, build a, a mobile multiplayer mobile game, right? It's four of you and you say, yay, let's do a mobile game. Um, you have to buy your, yourself PCs, so that's a uh, uh, capex. So what, what it means, you, you have to buy <coughs> some hardware and pay expenses on that hardware, right? So capital expenses so you are <coughs> kind of uh, spending money on stuff right so you bought yourself laptops you bought yourself licenses with the uh, software like uh, unity but actually unity license is not capex anymore it's opex because they pay you have to pay every month right and then you have to pay electricity which is opex as well so capex is capital expenses so the stuff that you bought and you can show you you have it and OPEX is operational expenses, which is kind of uh, things that you continuously pay, but you don't have anything to show for it, right? If you say, I bought a PC last month, then this PC is here, you, you still have it. If you said, I paid electricity bill last month, there's nothing to show for it. You, you, you paid and you've used the electricity and there is nothing left. Um, so with cloud, you can balance how much upfront investment you have to take and how much operational costs you will be incurring as you move along with your company, right? So for example, if you're building this mobile game and initially you have 10 people playing it, there is no point for you to buying a server farm which can host a million players, right? There will be an uh, enormous capital expense to set up a data center to cater for million players in the first month of your game release which only has 10 players playing, right? You spend millions of dollars on this infrastructure and nobody's using it. With cloud, you can pay for 10 people playing it and you don't have a capital expense at all. You only have OPEX, right? Uh, if there is a million play players playing it, you will play the host provider for million players playing it and maybe at that point, it will be cheaper for you to build your own infrastructure because you have to pay a little bit of profits to the cloud operator, right? So you're letting them earn some money on, on your players. But then again, you have benefits like you don't need to maintain it. You don't worry about all this infrastructure support and so on. They are in the business of providing that support. Um, 
So it's uh, pros and cons. You know, if your value of four of you working on games is working on games, maybe you shouldn't get into a business of uh, maintaining the infrastructure. You should let others to maintain the infrastructure for you. Um, all right. Um, so balancing OPEX and CAPEX is kind of a, a, a big deal, right? Uh, it's a big deal, not only from the technological point of view, but also from the business point of view. So, um, yeah, I don't remember which conference was it, but we, we recently had this discussion why there are no cars which cannot be stolen, right? Uh, the car manufacturers can build a car which will not be possible to be stolen. Uh, it, it could cost you, I don't know, um, 200,000 krona more, right? But you can buy a car which is physically impossible to, to be stolen. Uh, why they don't do that? Well, because people don't want to have the capex up front. They prefer having a model where you pay a little bit every month of insurance. If your car is stolen, you get your money back, right? Uh, so people changed um, the way the business works by having a preference for OPEX versus CAPEX. It's always better to say, I want to pay a little bit of fee every month than to pay kind of a one giant sum up front for something that you may potentially not use. So if in the lifetime of a car, you are the owner who uses the car, let's say for 50% of the lifetime of the car, why should you pay the capital expense when you're buying a new car for the entire safety of the car? It kind of doesn't make sense, right? It's better than you paid for the four or five years of you using the car and someone else pays for the remaining years by using the insurance model, right? Um, so yeah, you, you know, balancing CAPEX and OPEX is kind of a, a, a big deal and the world is moving towards OPEX. Uh, we used to have um, economies and kind of uh, business models based on CAPEX more. People were owning houses, were owning cars and so on. And now, especially the the younger generations are more into pay as you need type of thing. So they're more into renting things and kind of are paying, you know, um, per usage. All right, so yeah, so cloud is becoming big deal. We kind of talked a, a lot of about the benefits, so I will not uh, iterate over the benefits again. But what we can do is we can focus a little bit on the concerns. So what are the bad things about the cloud computing? Um, you know, uh, even though it is advertised uh, as a, a super good solution for per per performance and scalability and so on, you have server level agre agreements, so uh, SLAs, and depending, you, you're basically getting what you're paying for, plus minus an error, right? So with, for example, GitLab, um, you know, bad things happen and certain things cannot be recovered because a service level agreement was violated. Um, so let's say you ha you've been hosting some data um, with, with Google, for example, and then there is uh, some sort of uh, economic tension between US and your own country, and then suddenly you can't access your data for some reason, right? Uh, well, so, you know, there is some privacy, security concerns. Uh, there is um, a plethora of different choices you can make uh, and navigating through the space of what you're paying for, what you're getting from it, and so on is not easy. Uh, you don't know what are the legal implications of storing data. Like we know, for example, that if you're using any of the US-centric cloud providers, your data is subject to uh, US kind of regulatory concerns and the NSA can kind of look into it uh, and the providers will expose your, your data to, uh, to the US officials. Many other countries have similar uh, rules and regulations. Um, so it's not as simple, right? Uh, <laughs> you have non-standard APIs. Some people encode things like properly using JSON, some do not. Some people are using SOAP, some using JSON, uh, some using XML, some using plain text. You have to match things. So it's 
Um, it's not a solution which is like uh, a silver bullet which solves all the problems. It's a solution which solves some of the problems but introduces others. Um, there is some work happening right now on the uh, homomorphic encryption schemes and the ability for you to store something in the third party cloud provider without them being able to know what it is, but you can still use it. Uh, it uses a clever uh, tricks with uh, public-private cr key cryptography to make sure that you can compute certain things without the host provider actually knowing the data. Uh, you also have an emerging field of um, kind of uh, multi-party computations, uh, secure computations, in such a way that you can have multiple computers computing something without revealing of what um, is being actually computed. So one of the uh, well-known well known problems in that area is the problem of, um, it, it's called millionaire problem, so, or billionaire problem. So two, you know, US billionaires meet and they say, um, okay, so I would like to know if I'm richer than you, but I don't want to tell you how much I have. And, you know, obviously you don't want to tell me how much you have. So how can we know which of us is richer if we don't want to reveal the wealth information about each other, right? How would you do that? Um, so one trivial way is you um, ask a trusted third party, which both of the billionaires trust. So then they tell this trusted third party how much they have. And then the trusted third party says, you know, John is richer, right? Um, but th that one has a flaw, right? You really need to trust the trusted third party never to leak the information about wealth of the two participants. But you can do that using cryptography. So you can um, create a particular program. Um, yeah, we, we haven't discussed it uh, before, but um, let's say I have a function uh, which takes two parameters, A and B, right? So let's say I have, a, uh, let's write it here. So if I make it bigger, oops, I actually made, made it smaller. Okay, so let's use the, let's use the whiteboard. So if I have a function um, which takes two parameters, I have a function which, um, let's say, function f, which takes two int parameters, um, so a and b, and returns an int. Okay. So if I have f, I have a normal function, and I can call it with two parameters. So if I call it with one one, I filled in the the parameter set of this function, but and then I can uh, say f11 plus f11, and I can make this into a function. So I, I say g is a function which takes this expression and evaluates it, right? So when I use g, I will do this. But before I call g, I haven't done this, right? So this is called lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation is I actually don't know the result until I need it, and when I need it, <coughs> the computation will actually happen, okay? Um, so one concept here is lazy evaluation, which means I don't actually have the value for G before I call G, because I never really calculated that. So lazy evaluation is when we have a <coughs> computation which we haven't evaluated yet because we didn't need it and then we evaluate it when we need it. So that's one concept. The second concept is I can have a function now which has one with nothing here and that's my g. Okay? So my g now takes one parameter which is integer and returns an int and what g does, g will call f 
with 1 and with i to get the result. Make sense? So I turned a function which takes two parameters into a function by with one parameter by fixing one of the parameters um, already. So g takes one parameter and it basically calls f1 with this extra parameter. Um, so if I think about it in those terms, and if I fix one of the parameters, so if, if this function takes two parameters, and I fix one of the parameters, I kind of uh, have um, made the pot potential space kind of smaller, and this is called carrying. So this is called carry, uh, when you fix one of the function parameters and you have now less parameters to fulfill, right? Uh, so if I carry both, if I say f11, one, one, the, um, yeah, the ultimate kind of uh, filling in of the parameters leads to lazy evaluation because now I have a value which I don't know yet until I execute it, right? But if I do like this, I have a partial carry, right? So the billionaire problem, what we basically have is we have a function which needs two parameters and returns a bool, right? So if I get, you know, Frank and John wealth, it will tell me uh, if the first one is richer than the second one, for example, right? So what we need to do is we need to have um, a way of them fixing the function. So, you know, you, you give the, the function to, to Frank and you say, make a carry out of the function in such a way that it's cryptographically, um, um, you, you cannot break it, right? So he will give me G, which only takes one parameter, and G is a carried version of this fu original function <coughs> with the, say, Frank wealth already filled in. And then you ask John to call this function and John will get the, uh, the response, right? Um, without ever knowing what Frank put into the carry. If you're using kind of a um, specially designed Boolean circuit to calculate the function, right? I will, uh, I will need to spend much more time on actually explaining it, but what you do is your logical functions basically map to, uh, to like a gate structure, and you build a circuit which kind of uh, makes it difficult for somebody not knowing what the partial carry was to decipher of what it was. Um, it's actually provably impossible. Provably impossible to crack. Um, so the bottom line <laughs> here is, there is research happening on how to make computing safe in such a way that you can run it in the cloud and nobody knows what it's doing, but it's actually computing what it's supposed to without leaking any information up to, uh, to the outside world. Um, so we actively looking into this area and trying to work out what's possible and currently uh, we know theoretically everything is possible, it's just impractical because building those functions, those encrypted functions, takes a lot of computational resources. Uh, it's a very time-consuming process. So we know how to do it for some subsets of the problems. Uh, and for example, um, zero coin is one of the blockchain protocols which utilizes this mechanism for uh, hiding the information about the transactions in the blockchain. Uh, for some of the cryptographic operations that they use, like hashing or encryption. Uh, but in general sense, we cannot do that yet for a general purpose computing. Um, on a conference last week, there was a talk about using it for regular expressions. Um, we will talk a little bit about regular expressions um, next week. Yeah. And uh, Christopher will kind of tell you how it works. I Sorry? I, I won't be an expert. Oh, yeah, yeah, in two weeks' time. Um, so, Th there is progress happening. All right, so here I have um, a giant complex picture of uh, which most of you cannot see uh, of how the different services and offerings are kind of um, um, happening. So in the first lecture, we talked about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service and kind of general cloud software in general, which uses one of those three, right? So here is a number of buzzwords or terms that you 
should know or should be kind of familiar with, maybe not all of them, but some of them uh, being kind of utilized by Amazon and Google and all other providers. They kind of fit somewhere in that picture. Um, all right, so um, let's have a short break. So let's let's meet um, 20 past 20 past 12, and we'll continue about the challenges. And then I will move the lecture a little bit more towards networking. All right, so let's let's continue with the with the discussion. Uh, we have two small things left here. Uh, so opportunities and challenges. Uh, we kind of covered it. Uh, so you can read the slides. Um, there are some security considerations and so on. We've already discussed it. Uh, so what I want to do with the remainder of the class is to focus on the networking. Um, so, so far we have done some of the REST APIs. You talked over REST to GitHub API and you've built your own REST server where you can accept uh, particularly, particularly formatted uh, REST calls. Um, and I've already told you that there is an alternative protocol which uses XML, which is called uh, SOAP. Uh, so cloud services either use SOAP or REST APIs. Yeah. And, graph, yeah. and GraphQL, yeah. So there, are, there is a movement towards uh, using a GraphQL as well. Uh, so there are alternatives, right? But all those three are examples of remote procedure calls. Um, and this con concept goes back, um, you know, quite a lot. So if I go uh, RPC Wikipedia, you can read, oops, you can read about remote procedure calls uh, and learn a little bit of a history of how we've used it in computer science how we do it with uh, object-oriented languages. Um, yeah, why the screen is not on at all. <coughs> so you have the, um, so remote procedure call is when, you know, uh, you want to make a function call to a computer which is not your local computer. That's basically the, the you know fundamental theory behind it. So let's say you're writing a program, you're saying, you know, uh, print, add, whatever functions you're calling, and then one of the functions is not actually on your local computer, it's somewhere else. Uh, that's what the remote procedure calls are for, and that's how, you know, the, the whole uh, technology started, and we have, um, different solutions for different programming languages and for different frameworks and so on. We are currently trying kind of a language independent protocols like REST or GraphQL. Uh, so then we can invoke a particular function on a remote server and get some data back. And that's what this question about marshalling and unmarshalling comes from uh, and also serialization, right? So uh, I uh, direct you to the uh, discussion board and we had some discussions about that there um, so um, that leaves us to so those three concepts are kind of I would consider we kind of know them right uh, we know them because we've been using them we've used the rest API and rest API is an example of R RPC so we kind of cover that there is a number of concepts which we haven't covered, and I am not sure how much you already know, all right? So how many of you know OSI uh, networking model, model? How many of you have seen this before? It doesn't fit on the screen, but it starts. It starts with the physical layer. Okay, let me find. Uh, yeah, here. So we have a physical layer at the bottom, 
Then we have a data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application layers. Have you seen that diagram before? On which subject? Perfect, exactly. Um, so the rest of you haven't had ever discussed the seven layers of the OSI model, right? Um, so I encourage you to read about it. Uh, it's a little bit of a theory. There is not much, you know, um, extra information I can tell you about it. Uh, just check, you know, Wikipedia and read about this. Uh, there is a simplified model, which, um, you know, uh, takes the, like, um, let's say these two together, and then uh, TCP IP as uh, two layers, and then the application layer as a fourth layer. So there is a simplified four layer model, model which kind of bundles up the first two together, then uses IP and TCP or UDP as two consecutive ones, and then the application layer on top, right? So I will spend a little bit of time discussing the, the simplified model. Um, so if we uh, consider the, okay, so those of you who, who had it, what's the example of the protocol on the layer two? Can you give me a, a protocol which operates on layer two? Yeah, so what's the protocol called? What's that cable? The one which is plugged into this socket, how we call this cable? Ethernet. Ethernet, whoa, that's exactly layer two, right? So Ethernet is the protocol which is based on frames and it's a data link layer which provides the you know capabilities of my laptop to talk to the network so we have rj45 you know which is the specification for the plugs and we have ethernet which is the the protocol um, can i transfer files purely using ethernet Why not? As long as you plug in two computers together using Ethernet, uh, you can transfer files. You would probably need to write your own client for that, uh, but you can transfer files directly from one computer to the, to the other. What's the... Um, so I have a network card, I have another network card, and I have the Ethernet cable between those two network cards, and I'm using Ethernet protocol um, normally, um, how do I uh, address that the, the frame is designed for that network card? What do I use? Address. MAC address, exactly. So Ethernet address is the MAC address, which is the address which is of the physical network card that we use, right? So if I put a switch in between, uh, and now my frame goes into the switch, and the other computer um, MAC address is on port, <coughs> say, zero, the packet will go to port zero and will go over there. Most switches learn <coughs> of where the MAC addresses are, so they don't push the packet to all the, you know, you know how the switch works, it kind of has an entry and multiple exits, uh, so if the packet comes in, it doesn't push to all the exits, it kind of remembers of where the MAC address was. So initially, if it doesn't know, it will push that frame to everybody. But then once some sort of response goes back, you have a destination and source um, MAC address, the switch will learn and will stop passing to everybody. It will only pass to the um, port which it knows about. What happens if the frame hits my network card and it has a destination MAC address which is not my MAC address. What will happen to the frame? It's dropped. So all network cards basically drop everything which is not for them, right? So if I have a switch which passed a frame to me that was not intended to me, I, I just <coughs> drop that frame, right? 
um, what is it called when I turn my network card to a mode where I do keep all those frames on my network device? Spying. Spying, yes, that's good. Good name. It's a kind of a complex English word. Okay. So promiscuous mode is a special mode on Ethernet that allows a NIC to get all the traffic even if it was not intended for it, right? Way, when we do use it, we use it when we do packet sniffing, when we want to know what happens on the network, right? So because I'm plugged into Ethernet here, I don't only ha see traffic which is this, the, this, um, designed for my computer, I see ev all the traffic which happens on this kind of Ethernet connectivity and I can observe who is sending frames to whom, right? I can sniff the packets. Uh, but I have to turn my uh, network interface controller or card into a promiscuous mode. Can you play games, yeah? Yeah. The, the, the stack. Is it also called the TCP IP stack? So the TCP IP stack is the simplified one. It's the okay. four layers one. And the OSI is the full seven layers one. You need to know both, but the, the simplified one is a subset, right? Um, so what what do I mean you need to know it? I, I You need to know what the names of the seven layers are and you have to give me examples of all the protocols on each of the layers. So if I ask you, okay, give me a pr name of a protocol, example protocol on layer four, you should say, okay, layer four is this and the example protocol is this, okay? Um, as I said, it's not much of a fun, it's just a little bit of memorization you have to do. When you deal with networking, it just comes naturally. You naturally know, you know, TCP IP, TCP, which layer is that? IP, which layer is that, right? You know IP is layer three, TCP is layer four. You know what is other examples of layer three? You know IPv4, IPv6. They were others historically, but we don't use them anymore. Uh, what's the examples of layer four? TCP, UDP, and so on and so forth. So um, it's not super complicated, a little bit of memorization. Um, what we need to know, so the, as I said, um, we have the OSI layered model and we have the simplified TCP IP stack. We talked a little bit about Ethernet, layer two. Layer one, physical. Uh, you know, there are some uh, protocols related to the physical layer, but, um, and cabling and, and you know fiber optics and all that, but we don't go there. We start with layer two Ethernet. Uh, can you play games using Ethernet? No. So historically, yes, you could play LAN games purely over Ethernet, but you would have to have a server and the clients using the Ethernet protocol, and you'd have to have everybody in the same room using the same switch and everybody connected physically with each other, right? So it is kind of limited in the social, um, yes? You mean like all the, uh, the way all the first LAN, LAN parties started? Yes, exactly, exactly. So I mean the advantage is that it's super fast. You have very small lag and you can be super fast in communicating, <coughs> right? So for fun, for example, we wrote a small uh, test where we transferred, um, we transferred large file over ethernet or over uh, TCP IP. And you have a huge savings. You can transfer large files purely over ethernet, uh, I don't remember, like four or five times faster than over uh, TCP IP stack, right? Because you just have more data packaged into a frame and you don't deal with the TCP IP headers and so on. Um, so you, yes, you can play games using uh, purely ethernet and that's how you know LAN parties and so on started, but you don't, 
typically do that anymore because you want to be more encomp encompassing. You want others to be able to play with you even if they are not physically plugged in via Ethernet cable to you, right? So that leads us to a question, how would we do that? How can I talk to someone in New Zealand which is on a completely different LAN with a completely different switch which doesn't know my MAC address uh, and they are plugged into the in internet and I'm plugged in here and how it happens that we actually can send packets to each other. Yep. Say it again. Yeah, it's more complicated. Like in simple terms, how does it happen? So, so, yeah. Exactly. We need some sort of schema which allows us to globally identify each other to send messages from and to, right? Uh, and this globally unique schema is MAC addresses. Are MAC addresses globally unique? Yes, yes they are. Manufacturers have certain ranges and they should not collide, <coughs> right? So technically MAC addresses give us that. So why don't we use Ethernet to talk to people in New Zealand? You can fake MAC addresses, true. Exactly. So there are a number of reasons why we don't use uh, Ethernet. One of them is, you know, depending on what I want to uh, transfer. Uh, if I want to transfer a single frame, Ethernet is great and it would probably work, but it wouldn't really work because it doesn't scale. It doesn't kind of make sense to have a global registry of all the world's MAC addresses to be able to route my traffic to somebody else's computer in New Zealand, right? Uh, we, it, it kind of, you know, it doesn't scale. What we need is some sort of hierarchical system which scales from smaller units to larger units and back to smaller units, right? So telephone network is like that. In telephone networks, we have phone numbers and the phone numbers have a country code. And then when, we, when I dial to Poland, you know, the first two digits get me to Poland and then the next gets me to the Polish operator and then that blah, 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 right? We have a hierarchy. If everybody's phone numbers would be random, it would, potentially be able to work, but you know, my operator would need to have a database of all possible phone, ad phone uh, numbers of everybody in the world to be able to route me to that, uh, to that person, right? Uh, so Ethernet doesn't have a hierarchy. It's just a random, semi-random, globally unique ID, and we don't store it like in global registrars. We do store it locally, for routing traffic to me. So once the packet hits uh, NTNU campus, it knows that actually my MAC address is somewhere in Jovic, so it kind of, I mean, it doesn't know the MAC address yet. It knows that my IP address is somewhere in Jovic, gets packet to the Jovic um, uh, campus, and then the Jovic campus at some point will go to a switch which knows my MAC address, and then it will pass the packets to the MAC address of my machine because I've been advertising my MAC and my IP address through that switch before, right? Uh, so we have switching and routing. We've introduced the concept of routing, right? What is the difference between switching and routing? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good answer, uh, and it's a correct answer. 
Uh, in simple terms, you can think of switching as happening on layer two uh, and routing happening on layer three, right? <coughs> so usually switches operate on the ethernet and the routing operates on layer three, which in our case is IPv4 or IPv6. Um, so we, again, we got to the IP layer. Um, what's IP stands for? <coughs> Internet protocol, version four and version six, right? Um, when we asked, okay, can we use Ethernet to talk to someone in New Zealand? The answer was, yeah, it's not a good idea. We need something else. So we came up with layer three on the stack. We built on top of layer two, on top of e Ethernet, and we designed internet protocol for this global communication network. Uh, so instead of using frames, we now use what's called packet. So that's again, layer two. Usually we talk switching frames Layer three, we usually talk packets, packet headers, uh, routing. And we ha have this hierarchical, globally unique IDs, which are called IP addresses, right? So IP addresses, uh, version four, how they look like. Yeah? yeah. Yep. So, yeah. four, bytes. four bytes, right? Four bytes. In, in general, IPv4 addressing are using a schema which uses four bytes, right? So if we have four bytes, how many addresses are there? But don't, don't give me the number, give me the formula that you would use to calculate the number. Yeah? Yep. So four bytes, it's 32 bits and two to the power of 32, right? Uh, roughly speaking. Uh, what's the addressing schema for IPv6? How many bytes do we use there? 64 bits, which is eight bytes, right? Much larger uh, addressing uh, space. Okay, so now we kind of jumped from switching on ethernet to routing on the, in, uh, on the IP protocol. So I can send a packet now to New Zealand, okay? Can I send a file to New Zealand using IP? Why not? <coughs> yeah, that's one reason. What's, uh, what else? What's other property of the IP layer? Yeah? No, IP. IP is unreliable. It's a best effort. If I send a packet over IP, I have no guarantees that it will reach the destination, right? Yeah, That's exactly the point. So the point is that I have, um, I, uh, where is our OSI layer? Okay. I have frames here and what will happen if my network card tries to push a frame into the Ethernet cable and some of your computers on the same network here try to push a frame just a little bit faster than mine? What will happen to my frame and your frame? They get collision, right? So there is something on the wire already. So my 
card will probably, if it notices it, it will not push because there is a collision or it tries to push at the same time and there is rubbish happening on the wire, right? If you have an Ethernet um, setup with multiple computers on the same switch and there is a lot of traffic, the traffic gets actually slower because there is a lot of collisions happening. So you don't get kind of a good quality of the uh, data transfers that you're doing, but you have a lot of collisions. And if the frame is lost, the frame is lost, right? Uh, if the frame collided with something, the frame collided. I have to resend. I have no reliable... Um, um, I mean, I have to repeat the frame to get the, the reliable transfer happening, right? The actual individual frame is not uh, reliable. Then on the network layer, I have, um, I have routing, I have traffic control, and I can send packets, but I don't have reliability, right? I have to build this re reliability on top of it. As you were mentioning, we could use TCP to have a reliable transmission, right? That's what we need to send files over. We want to preserve the order, and we also want to make sure that everything was actually delivered, right? Good. Yeah. So, 128 bits. Um, you um, can sometimes say, I don't uh, really care about the reliability. I, uh, I <coughs> want speed and I want stuff that was not delivered to be dropped. In which case, you would use UDP, right? Yeah? Like video streaming, voice streaming, any type of streaming, or maybe in games as well, you're communicating the state of the other player, but if that communication gets, you know, if one of the packets got lost, you will just update the position in the next frame. You don't want stuff to be resent. Uh, you don't care what happens to frame back if the guy is already here. You just update the position to, to here, right? Um, so, this is what the IP and TCP kind of uh, give us. And in general, if you look into the, um, into the terminology and into the actual structure, you will notice that it's like onion. It starts with the um, you know, frame, with the frame header, and then there is a layer of IP with IP header, and then there is a layer of TCP or UDP with the TCP or UDP header, and so on and so forth, up to a point, like for example, when you're talking about you know, uh, HTTP and other protocols, which also typically have some header and the payload. We were dealing with header in our Go program. We were setting HTTP header content type to application JSON. So the data you know, which we were sending had some sort of header with some sort of payload. Um, okay, so uh, we're running out of time and there is one more topic that you need to know and that's uh, CIDR. Uh, so in here I have one more thing which is called CIDR. How many of you know that? Those of you who did the communication probably know. Uh, those who don't, um, you will know about it for, for next week, okay? So read about this and try to make some simple, um, I will post a simple exercise on Blackboard for you to design a schema for a network mask for a given uh, setup. So then you can allocate a particular amount of uh, hosts um, and the network mask in such a way that you can cope with the size of the network for your for your setup. Why is this why this is important? <coughs> well, this is important because when you're deploying your own cloud solution and you need to create a virtual network and you have a database server, you may have a, a load balancing for the uh, HTTP traffic, and you want to set up some sort of resources. You usually need to allocate. Uh, IP addresses and you need to design how your network kind of looks like. You can use, uh, you can be within a particular class. There are four classes of IP uh, networks. There is class A, B, C, and D, right? Uh, 
class A uh, uses the first byte as the uh, network mask and then the remaining three bytes for addressing the hosts and then class D is the opposite so it only allows you to address 100, uh, 250 uh, four or 53 uh, hosts uh, and it uses the three bytes for the network mask so um, please uh, yeah check the tutorial uh, and then at the beginning of uh, not next week in two weeks time uh, we will check it I will post some exercises on on it for the uh, on the blackboard so you can do some simple designs all right Okay, so thank you for today.